how did you respond to the election result? And how do you think that's going to resonate mm. uh, with climate change? Well, I mean, it's been interesting even the last two days. We've just had a, a crazy level of interest since that happened. Um, and I think that no matter what result happened on Saturday night, it didn't exclude the fact that we all need to step up and get involved. Like, no one's going to come in and wave a magic wand and, and make it happen. The, the change happens at a community level from individuals. That's how any great change in history has happened. So it's usually that sort of top-down structure that responds the last. So. Uh, it was a little bit disappointing, obviously, for a host of reasons, but um, I do feel that people are going to be more galvanised now to actually get on with it and take action. So, Well, probably the most optimistic take is that Tony Abbott's not there anymore, and he was one of the major deniers of that party. There's no doubt about it. Frydenberg, even yesterday morning, said, look, we understand the science is real. We know climate change is happening. So, and I've never heard him say that before. Um, and even I, I have faith that Morrison's got two kids and that he's going to care about this issue. And, you know, the, the film, as you know, is... We tried to write a line that wasn't overly political because this issue never should have been political. And it wasn't. It was bipartisan in the 80s. It was, we had Margaret Thatcher, we had George Bush Senior saying that this is the greatest challenge we face, but then it got dragged into the mud. So really the, the film is trying to rise above all that and say, this is about our kids. It's about the bloody air we breathe and the water we drink. Can we just get on with dealing with like adults and keep it out of that political space? Get what did you think of all those kids demonstrating? I think it's magnificent. Again, this is how history's worked. It's taken passionate groups of people to take on authorities and say, we want something different. And these kids get it. We're just going to schools around the country at the moment. The kids are so articulate. They're, so, they're asking more eloquent questions than any of the adults. And you know, this is, again, how, this is how the abolitionists turned over slavery. And they were told to get off the streets. It's a utopian idea that the economy would ever, ever survive without slaves. Suffragettes, interracial marriage in America, it's all followed the same path. And here we are having our leaders saying, kids need to get back to school. Now the kids know what's going on and they're not going to stop until they see change. Um, Frederick Douglass is one of the abolitionists and he said, um, it's a lot easier to build stronger children than it is to repair broken men. And I think it's exactly what we're dealing with with the climate now. Let's let these kids come through. Let them ha have their voices heard because they're the ones that are going to usher the change. And this is really this is in schools, you've got programs in schools. All in schools. Got... Teachers can download free 31 lesson plans from grade 5 to 10. Uh, Palace Cinemas this weekend offering free tickets to any school student at the cinema if they go with an adult because they believe in it and they know these kids need to hear these positive stories and need to believe that people do care about their future. What do you think about the term deniers? I did have it here as a question and you just used it there. Yeah. Some have argued that even if you are pro everything climate change mm. that the term is very antagonistic yeah. and it might actually be labelling people who might have just legitimate questions that they want to know the answers to. It was probably a little bit harsh 10 years ago and, and when there was room for more climate sceptics and I think a sceptic is very different to a denier because the sceptic asks the questions and tries to formulate in, in a really open way but we've done that and there's now a 97% consensus on it. It's the same way that tobacco causes lung cancer. Scientists don't muck around with the consensus. They send things back and forth and argue and discuss and they reach it only after so much debate, which has happened for 30 years. So we've reached the point now where we just can't give that air time anymore because that is exactly the tactic that these companies want us to do. Create ambiguity, create doubt in the space, which keeps it alive. That's how the tobacco did it, that's how sugar did it, and now the fossil fuels have done it. So I think I often say to people, if there's a 97% consensus, imagine you were about to get on a plane and 97 airline mechanics were on one side of the gate and they said, Jim, don't get on the plane, it's going to crash, we're certain. Three airline mechanics were on the other side saying, you know what, I don't know if the science is settled. Are you going to get on the plane or not? And unfortunately, we're not listening to those 97, we're giving far too much air time to the three. So like, I think we've got to reach a point where we're not going to give equal weight to a flat earther on, on a TV show, because we know that's just preposterous. Why do we keep giving a platform to deniers when we know the science is that solid? So. It is a time to move on. We've, we've had that debate. We know what the answer is. Now we've got to solve it. Let's just get on with it. So tell us about this epiphany that you had mm -hmm. uh, that has turned you mm -hmm. into a full-time filmmaker, a former actor who doesn't want to act anymore. Is mm -hmm. this correct? Yeah, I mean, I... This is a big, this is big news. Oh, not really. It's, it's hardly big news. I don't think anyone's going to stop the stream and go, Dan McGammon's not acting anymore. Oh, God, no! You're sacrificing what yeah. could be a very lucrative future sure. in acting yeah, yeah. to take on a much more perilous yeah. and risky yeah. venture yes. making documentary films yeah. uh, that uh, promote some sort of activism. That's right. 
So don't downplay it, Dan. No. It's a I, big um, deal. Yeah, I think every time I was acting, I always had a sense of like, this isn't enough. Like, I wanted to tell my own stories. And I was lucky enough to work with people like Rob Connolly or Rolf Tahir, and, you know, who were telling beautiful stories, but they weren't coming often enough. And I always felt this frustration. Like, I've got things to say. Why am I bloody saying them? So it really was a bit of a moment, a turning point, meeting my wife and also just realising I was actually quite sick in hospital one night with, with four other people in their 80s in a hospital. And I wrote myself a letter about two in the morning saying, if I was 80 right now, have I done the things I wanted to do? Have I actually told the story or did I always hide behind acting? Which was in a lot of ways simple, you know, you turn up, you get fed, you do your job. It's not to say it's a, a beautiful craft and people are brilliant at it, but I just never really resonated with it with all my fibre. And then the minute I started um, just researching, exploring the film thing, I just fell in love with it. So. All that other currency, valuing that or the, whatever might come with acting, it just pales for me personally um, in, in comparison with, with helping people or seeing the impact that a film can have, like people reversing their type 2 diabetes or losing weight, or in this case seeing the kids have hope in a cinema. That's, that's worth everything. So I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't uh, bemoan the acting industry, it's just not for me anymore. Just to, to, again, for the record, so is the acting door shut, or are you open if someone, if Spielberg comes along, or if someone comes along and says, I saw your documentary, I saw you in your documentary. I saw you as a 60 year old man, I'll yeah. tell you what. You go, yeah. No, look, I, um, I love still being, doing that performance in my own films, like I love doing that. Yeah. So I'm not going to say never is never, but um, I feel like there's so much to do, especially under this topic, like that, you know, I, I want to sort of give as much of my energy and time into things that I really, really believe in. Yeah, apparently, Tiffany, I understand what's the reaction Mm. that you got from Sugar Phil. Mm. And again, mate, just really quickly, yeah. what was the impact that yeah. that film has had? Uh, Can you characterise it for yeah, me? Yeah, it's been extraordinary. I, mean, I guess the fact that it's in so many schools around the world, around well, the world, yeah, and especially in Australia, they teach it now as part of the curriculum. Um, so again, stop, being stopped in the street still happens quite regularly that people say, hey, thanks so much, my, you know, my wife reversed her type 2 diabetes, it really helped. So that's, that's quite incredible. And also at a policy level, we did, Two screenings with the UK Parliament, one was with Jamie Oliver and, and they implemented a sugary drinks tax. We did a screening for the New Zealand government and they got rid of sugary drinks in their hospitals. So just to see what that can do, like telling a story. And I think, as you know, like, um, you know, story is very powerful. Narrative is very powerful and Hollywood have known it. We know that um, the US military put money into Transformers for years, you know, because they know there's a very big patriotic story there and it's a great recruitment tool to take on the bad guys. So why not start using that for good, and especially in this, in, in sort of proposing a new future? All the Hollywood films are dystopian. Any any portrayal of the future, you know, Blade Runner or anything, you know, there's no nature. Humans are in slums. Um, there's robots everywhere. That doesn't necessarily have to be our future. And so I think it was important to show that there are alternatives. We can have nature in our cities. It can be a little bit different. Otherwise, people are going to go, well, that's just what we're going to get in the future, and I think that's dangerous. You're very, very a a admire so much the yeah. philosophy that's gone in behind this film, yeah. where you want it to be positive yeah. uh, around all the negativity mm. about climate change, mm. and there have been some pretty shocking ones that's to right. have to sit through. Can you identify uh, maybe two or three yeah. favourite sound bites or, or uh, clips or film clips yeah. that particularly sort of got you on edge saying, I don't need to hear this again. You know, when you do follow this stuff, it, there's something every day. Whether it's a, a million species that are about to face extinction, whether it's, you know, monarch butterflies, 97% wiped out, flying foxes in Australia, we lost one third of our population on two days of heat last November, but they just died. Like, there's an apocalypse going on for a lot of creatures around the planet. And also just the, whether it's the melting ice caps or the lack of action from governments, you know, it's very hard not to be overwhelmed and disengaged with that constant torrent of negativity. And one of the big turning points was speaking to an environmental psychologist about this and absolutely reaffirmed that, that the neuroscience says that if that information constantly comes to us, it activates this part of our brain called the limbic system. And that shuts down our ability to creatively think, problem solve, all the things we need to actually get us out of this mess. So um, that was a big part of making the film, is not to say we don't need to deeply feel the problem as it is and, honor, and acknowledge that and go, yeah, things are, are really dire at the moment. But the way to motivate us and to move forward, as we are as humans, is to show up visions of a, what's, a, what's possible or a hope that we can actually strive for and go, no, if we can, if we can get there, we can, we can change the world and create a better place for our kids. So that's all this is. It's trying to restore the balance. It's not saying let's override that because we need the reality. It's like going to the doctor. 
you want him to tell you what your problem is and how bad it is, but you then want him to say, well, here's some things you can do. But that's what we're not getting in the mainstream. Congratulations on imposing a rigour yeah. on your approach mm -hmm. that you would only extrapolate from what's available now. Mm -hmm. And I think that that stuff works really well mm -hmm with um, stuff about soil mm -hmm. and the power that's and the seaweed. Yeah. I thought that stuff was, was yeah. fantastic. But David, just hands, hands on the table, 100% honest, what percentage of this film is just wishful thinking? Uh, I don't think any of it because I've seen now, I've spent three years meeting these people and I know, I know now that it's possible and I think that's the key part of the film. Whether we get there is the big challenge. That's, that's the hardest question to ask, and that's not for any one person to solve. But we're not going to move forward and motivate people to get involved if they can't see that it's possible. And that's what my fear is with the kids at the moment, and this nihilistic narrative that's emerging, even for some professors saying, you know what, the human race is doomed. But that doesn't help anyone. It's going to be the greatest challenge we ever face as a human species to pull this off. But we're not going to get there unless okay. we know it's possible. So, I get. I guess yeah. with, the, with the various issues that you cover, mm. uh, you could gauge the likelihood or the plausibility yeah. of each one. Yeah. Some of them I think are, are very high, yeah. very attractive, yeah. such as the power sharing. I think that's great. Yeah. The seaweed stuff, the soil really hits a nerve with Australians. That's right. The stuff about cars. Yeah. I think people just have a, an instinct against mm. getting in a car that doesn't have a driver in it. Absolutely. My understanding is that the only way the driverless cars work mm -hmm. is that if they are part of a closed network Correct. of driverless Correct. cars. Yep, that's right. And that that's something that's going to inhibit. That's right. It's, it's, uh, it's so closed. where it will roll out first, if it does happen, is going to be in city areas. So obviously, as we say in the film, it'll be inner cities first and only. And New York is a perfect example. Singapore's already doing it by 2022. Like it's, it, it is happening in some parts of the world. So again, this is an extrapolation of things that already exist. The big challenge there would be the loss of jobs from the car industry could be enormous. So if we had a switched on government that said, right, let's set up some kind of transition fund to help these workers, we'll support them through reskilling and retraining, that's common sense. That's what we should be doing. We kind of feel that this might be coming. The only reason I put that in was because the stats were so bleak about a projected extra 1 billion cars by 2040. So what that does for materials, energy, um, congestion, I just, I spent literally four or five months trying to find a way to get less cars. And this seemed like the only one. And what was valid about it was that it was based on economic grounds. That are you still gonna own a car and pay the insurance and pay the registration and the petrol costs? If they're gonna be four or five times more than subscribing to a, a transport provider. They and people you know? do that now because they love cars. Correct. They love car culture. That's right. Every Fast and Furious film that comes out makes a billion dollars. That's right. love. Mm, they they love that. But our generation do. But if you look at the stats of people under 25, yeah. a huge majority aren't getting licenses. It's already cheaper for them to get an Uber and get around town. What happens when that Uber driver goes and the driverless comes and it drops even more? There is a potential, again, that it's a possibility. I, I particularly like driving myself, so it's a challenge for me as well. But as the lady um, says in the film, it's not unreasonable to think that, that can, can, we can undo some of that because it has been marketed mm -hmm. to us. It has been sold. Yeah. So, again, this is why the, I made the film, to have these excellent discussions mm -hmm. and debates. We're not even having them at the moment, so yeah. I think it's really important to actually say, hey, what do you think of that? Do you vehemently disagree with it? Great. Let's all share what we want our 24 mm -hmm. to look like. Well, this issue is so important. Why not just put that on the internet for free for everyone? Oh, yeah. Tell us the harsh yep. realities of filmmaking yes. that prevent you from doing that. If I had my way, this would be out there right now on for free. No doubt about it. It's the same with sugar. Like the message is too important. And I hope that one of the, the people we're talking to for an overseas release did release Leonardo DiCaprio's film around climate for free for a week and had 60 million views of it. So that, that would be a great way to, to do it. The reality is the film costs $3.2 million. People lent us that money to make. Some of them want that money back. It's not a philanthropic donation where you can just do it. So it's a really tricky space. Um, but as you know, the other thing that people, it was funny when I was doing Sugar, some people would write and say, oh, I hope you're happy now, you know, the film's made all this money. In this country, cinemas take 70% of the return straight away. So if your film makes a million dollars, 700,000, bang, goes to the cinemas. That remaining 300,000 then goes to the P&A spend and all the publicity and whatnot. So the people who make the film are often the last in line. So I think it's important to understand that you've got to love what you do in this game to make docos and I don't think any documentary filmmaker makes them because they go, I'm going to make me some money. We're not in it for that. 
you're in it because you genuinely care and, and you want to get this message out. So, again, I'd happily get this film out for free if we could, and I, and I hope it does. By all means, down the track, you can buy it in Bali on the street in a DVD for about a dollar. That'd be great. What, I think my favourite segment in the film mm-hmm. appears to be an improvised moment which, when you're on the plane. Yeah. And it's like you just had yeah. a thought bubble yeah. and yeah. you just thought, I'm, I need to say something. Yeah. And you talk about that stuff about the, the fact that we do yeah. live in the creature comforts of a society built on fossil fuels and you can't deny the fact yeah. that it's, well, it's great, yeah, a lot right. of it is great. That's Can you just tell me yeah. a bit about that wonderful sequence that really, yeah. David, grounds the film yeah. against accusations that it's pie in the sky. That's right, and I think it is important to acknowledge the hypocrisy of everyone. You cannot do the right thing at the moment. So, here's a great example. I mentioned flying. We're flying around the world to make this film. I mean, of course we're going to burn carbon. Luckily, we've been able to offset wire emissions and plant a 2040 forest that's going to draw down an extra 90 tonnes of carbon, so we think the film is carbon positive. But you think about, we use 2,000 tonnes of carbon to make this film. Now, we're a small Australian documentary. What's the impact of a Netflix series? The Avengers. I hope people start labelling that up the front. So we all know, again, you can't do the right thing. Even if you're watching Netflix at home, you're contributing to the problem. So again, this psychologist said to me, if we do beat ourselves up or feel guilty, that also paralyses us. So we've all got to accept that there's nothing you can do and be a Puritan in this game at the moment. Our whole system is built on fossil fuels. The, The more we can accept that and start to move forward, we're more likely to get involved and take action.